Today I continue the tradition that is older than any of us, the Election Day Sermon. In the mid-18th century, Election Day was a colony-wide holiday in New England. It began with cannon firings, military exercises, and usually some form of procession of government officials from the seat of government to a nearby church. Citizens and members of the community listened to sermons carefully for several hours. Election Day sermons followed a typical pattern. First, they asserted that civil government is founded on an agreement between God and citizens to establish political systems that promote the common good, that government is necessary, but no system is perfect. Voters and candidates were told in those sermons that they must do what is needed for their peculiar circumstances. Secondly, the people were encouraged to promise to follow those they had elected, and the officials were to promise to act for the good of all. As long as they acted in their proper character, voters were to obey the officials. On the other hand, if the elected acted contrary to the terms of the agreement, people were duty-bound to resist. In all civic actions, voters and officials were charged to promote virtue, suppress vice, and support people of proven wisdom, integrity, justice, and holiness. Those were the days indeed. This Election Day sermon has built into it little naivete that our leaders will prove wise, full of integrity, work for justice, or holiness. Presiding over this sermon is the primary truth in any Election Day sermon, that politics are important, but never are they ultimately important. Ultimate, ultimate importance lives in the realm of faith and the arc of divine creation under which this election will be filed as a mere blip on the radar. Important all the same, but let's take a long view. Ultimately of little consequence is this election in the spectrum of the universe or even human history. We may feel like this week is an all or nothing moment. For sure, our democracy could be broken by this election. I have no doubt about that. I have no illusion that some involved don't believe in democracy and could and probably will try to steal the election. I believe democracy could break because I believe there is a spiritual element that has ended all elections in our lifetime. It is not the mere numbers of votes. It is an act of concession. Concession is a quality of humility, the kind that 18th century politicians were held accountable for. Today, concession for some is only where you buy a corny dog at the fair or a snack at a football game. But concession, the real meaning of concession, is important. It requires humility, saying, I lost and you won. And if concession in this election fails, which it almost certainly will, our democracy will be tested to the core. Now, I know there are those who've already given hope, up hope on this election in this scenario. Out of a broken trust, there are those who cannot believe in the outcome of this election. There are those who believe in conspiracies and that also nothing matters. We live in an era of eroded trust to which David Brooks recently commented that explosive distrust is not just an absence of trust or a sense of detached alienation. It is an aggressive animosity and an urge to destroy. He pointed out in his Atlantic article how distrust sows distrust, how it produces the spiritual state that Emile Durkheim called anomie, a feeling of being disconnected from society, a feeling that the whole game is illegitimate, that we are invisible and not valued, a feeling that the only person we can really trust is ourselves. That is a spiritual crisis, and one that lives in us as we approach Tuesday. But we must not let it erode our hearts, because we know that distrustful people try to make themselves invulnerable 
armor themselves up in a sour attempt to feel safe, and distrust and spiritual isolation lead people to flee intimacy and try to replace it with stimulation. We know that an explosive distrust is the belief that those who disagree with you are not just wrong, but illegitimate or evil or somehow bad to the core. Hannah Arendt once wrote that when people feel naked and alone, they revert to tribe or tribalism. Their radius of trust shrinks, and they only trust their own kind. And the result is a kind of fanaticism and existential anxiety. Believe me, my anxiety is up, as I believe is yours. I just took a vacation in which I rode a bicycle from Dallas to Austin and then to San Antonio and back up through the state. I saw how red most of this state is. But beyond how polarizing the state is, the flags that say God and guns and Trump or make liberals cry are not only false theological claims, but scary threats of tribalism. I was asked recently by a friend whether I still had faith in America, and I quickly stated that I did still have faith in America. While my trust and faith in politicians have, have eroded in the pre recent years, I have not given up, mostly because we are America. I said to her, you and I are America. The people working at the women's shelter downtown are America. The poll workers, the neighbors who checked on us when my father died, the people working to address police brutality or cure cancer or take care of patients at Parkland is America. This church that is adopting the Sydney Lanier Vanguard School polling place to feed and comfort voters in line on Tuesday is America. We are America. To have faith in the people of your community, to assume that we are interdependent, that we share the same moral values, is America. To believe that at some point we do share a sense of what is the right thing to do in certain situations is American, if not a human characteristic, a characteristic of trust built into us from the beginning of our need to survive. And I believe that deep down that we know how to be a country, to restore some sense of collaboration and trust, to join together in moments of need, because our survival depends on it. Because here is what is at stake. High trust societies have people who are able to organize more quickly, take action, sacrifice for the common good. In high trust societies, corruption is lower and entrepreneurship is catalyzed. High trust nations have lower economic inequality because people feel connected to each other and are willing to support a more generous welfare state. People in high trust societies are more civically engaged care about each other and take a longer view of what is important. It sounds a lot like this church to me. In the ancient story of Samuel from the reading today that Beth read, when the people cry out, give us a king, Samuel asks if that is what they really want. In some ways, theologically, it says God is king over all and a leader is a small replacement for something so grand. It is a story of handing over responsibility and taking a shorter view of what's important. Thankfully, we are not electing a king. No matter how much we hope our elected leaders will save our democracy, we must remember what America is, even through the clouded image of what it has become. The story of Samuel is infused in our nation's story. It starts with who we are, not wanting a king with power over us, but wanting elected leaders of responsibility and holiness, and remembering that a great arc of history exists beyond this week. The story makes a clear point to me that ultimacy is not decided in attaching ourselves to the outcome of one election like barnacles on a ship desperately hanging on. 
God says to Samuel in the story, the people have forgotten God. They look to things human and forget the grandeur of creation. In our church, I would interpret that to mean that while the particular moment is important, there is a grand timeline that we exist in. As long as we do our part, bend our part of the arc of humanity toward justice and compassion and love, we'll be able to look up and see that on Wednesday, whether a concession is made or not, whether we know the results or are mired in some scheme, that we will be okay. And if necessary, we will take a cue from the 18th century sermons and resist. I say to you today that no matter your despair or your hope that America is not broken beyond repair. That is an assertion of self-denigration to say it is broken. We are the government. We are America. And some of us are broken. And some of us are so politically tied to one partisan party that we can no longer be authentically patriotic. And some of us have lost faith in the whole endeavor. But almost all of us will wake up and see the sunrise on Wednesday and the months to come. We will roll up our sleeves and continue to grow what is important to us, no matter the results of this election. That said, I must say to you today, as I do every year, please vote if you have not already cast your ballot. Voting is a religious responsibility as well as a civic duty. People have given their lives for this high privilege, and they should not die in vain. Vote and then wait for the outcome of the counting the nation's votes assured that after the election, the great arc of time will still extend out. Our democracy still will rest on a strong constitutional foundation if we point to it. And we, the people, will have work to do to nurture mutual understanding and affection and reconciliation in a manner that helps heal the cavernous divides among us. No matter what happens, we will have work to do to enable us to speak with one voice again, to trust our neighbors, to secure our nation as a place of liberty and justice for all, to build affection among difference, to hold each other in esteem. The United States of America is the most daring experiment in democratic governance that has ever been fashioned. Our responsibilities are equal to its promise. Now, I have great doubts in our system of government at this point, but I also have faith in the structure of it. I love this country and its people. I hope that our future will thrive in ways that bring us together and create justice, not just for some. At the moment, we are being tested and the echoes of burn it all down aren't far from our ears, nor are they far from our lips. But if the United States of America is anything, it's about unity amidst diversity. E pluribus unum. Not one for many, but out of many, one. It is important that we are willing to take the responsibility to build the trust among us, to hold each other in esteem, for, one, for each of us to have a part in the welfare and the exercise of our rights. The most important thing you can do this week, if you haven't already, is to vote. It is also to hold out for humility, concession, trust, and holiness, spiritual values that only live if we live into them. The last word I give to David Brooks who said, trust can be rebuilt through the accumulation of small heroic acts by the outrageous gesture of extending vulnerability in a world that is mean by proffering faith in other people when that faith may not be returned. 
Sometimes trust blooms when somebody holds you against all logic, when you're expected to be dropped. It ripples across society as multiplying moments of beauty in a storm. To that I say, Amen, friends, and Amen.